Okay, well, we're going to get things kicked off. We've got a lot of great content today, so we want to get started on time. And if um, if we don't finish within the hour, you may get a little bit of bonus content to uh, to add to your day. So how about that? You get something extra you didn't even have to pay for. First off, my name is Rick Tullis. I am the current chairman of the board chair of the Greater Waco Chamber of Commerce, and I get to be the moderator today. Uh, I'm also very interested because I'm a local business owner and dealing with COVID issues with our team uh, regularly uh, now for the last six months. So the, the, look forward to getting some of this uh, content. The, this, um, this webinar really was came about through the discussion through some of our, our uh, city council men and, uh, and the mayor. There were a couple task force that uh, Mayor Deaver put together at the beginning of the COVID uh, challenge. And one is the health response and coordination task force that's head uh, headed by Councilman John Kennard and uh, also Dr. Jackson Griggs helps head that one. And one of the other task force is was uh, the Business and Individual Financial ta uh, Recovery Task Force uh, chaired by uh, Councilman Jim Holmes and Sarah Roberts from the Waco Business League. So between those two groups, it was the, the idea that, hey, this would be a great time to, to put some uh, um, timely information out there through a webinar to, uh, to the folks in the city. And that is really done within a greater, uh, broader partnership between many other uh, key organizations in our community, uh, including the Syntex Hispanic Chamber, the uh, uh, Syntex African American Chamber, Startup Waco, City Center Waco, the City of Waco, uh, McLennan County, the Waco Business League, and the Greater Waco Chamber of Commerce. So thankful for all those organizations and all the, uh, the the folks involved in looking out for the greater good of our city. Um, okay, so we wanna keep things moving here pretty quick. We wanna, I wanna introduce our, our speakers today, our, our panelists. So um, we should, uh, well, let me hit the agenda first. Uh, we'll, we'll be touching on these topics. Uh, and I wanna also say down at the bottom, uh, we show a Q&A and there will be one at the end, but we want you guys to interact during the webinar. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A icon. If you have a timely question in the midst of one of the, the uh, uh, presentations of, or, or discussions that's going on, please put it into the Q&A. And uh, it, you know, if it's timely and we can catch it, then we will. If not, we'll, we'll catch it on the back end uh, during the, the Q&A time at the end. So uh, feel free to, to jump in there and put that stuff out there. All right, so our panelists, uh, Dr. Ben Wilson, you can see uh, all the things he does here, I think uh, from the standpoint of, of uh, where he is in Waco, Texas right now, Associate Chief, Associate Chief Medical Officer for COVID-19 response at the Waco um, Family Health Center, a great organization that has served our community for a long time. And uh, he's got some great information for us. And then next we have uh, Teresa, Where's her slide? There it is, Teresa Schiller. She's a practicing lawyer uh, here in town at uh, the Bird Colgen Law Firm. And you can see down there in her bio, she worked in some smaller uh, cities before coming to Waco. So she's got a little bit of experience. She's kind of built her way up to Waco. So um, so with that being said, I'm trying to keep the, the pace going. I, I wanna give uh, each of our panelists a time to uh, just introduce themselves and uh, share some opening remarks. So uh, let's see, who, who wants to go first? Ben, why don't you go first? Yeah, I'll go first and then I'll uh, hand it over to Teresa for some opening remarks. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure being a part of this. I just wanted to, uh, we're gonna jump right in, but I just wanted to, um, uh, give just a little bit of background of what I think necessitated having this webinar. And in my experience over here at Family Health Center, I feel like there's been really just a, um, a pretty notable uh, lack of coordination and communication between the medical and business communities. And so I think um, having this today is key in that regard, in particular in the areas of uh, paid leave and return to work issues. And so that's going to be really the um, the bulk of what we're hoping to uh, touch on today. Um, I also just want to see that uh, say that uh, the, the resources will be referenced uh, that we're going to be referencing today during the talk will be available to you um, uh, in a Dropbox that uh, Jennifer Branch has uh, uh, made available. I believe um, she's emailing the link out to all the participants in an email. So um, don't uh, get too frantic if if um, we we Teresa and I are, are uh, 
uh, we reference something and it's not immediately, you're, just, you're kind of fumbling around on when it, where it was at, um, don't feel too much pressure to take notes. Um, <clears throat> so my goal today is really to um, put the tools in the hands of the employers to make real-time decisions about return to work issues and um, paid leave is issues without having to, um, in effect, get a note from the doctor um, uh, with every single decision that needs to be made. So hopefully you all can be empowered to, to make decisions that you uh, medically and legally can from your perspective. And Teresa, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my goal here today is to uh, talk about some of the minimum requirements for you as business leaders. Uh, I want to uh, uh, show the minimum that your businesses may need to do regarding coronavirus so that you can uh, focus on other aspects of your business, uh, uh, like satisfying the customers. So I'll turn it back to Rick. All right, well, we're going to hit our first topic, preparing for the workplace. So uh, Ben, I think you're going to kick us off there. That's right. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, yes. So just some general information. There's a whole lot of information here about um, how to make the workplace a sanitary place, a socially distanced place, um, all the different precautions that we have out there related to COVID. So, you know, that's really going into all that in details beyond the scope of this discussion, unfortunately, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of, the, of some key resources. Um, one of those is the COVID Waco website. Um, I actually uh, assisted in authoring some of the material there um, that is specifically for businesses, actually. And so um, if you go to covidwaco.com, you go to the reopening tab, there's a couple uh, resources in that drop down menu that are specific for businesses. So I encourage you to uh, take a look there. There's also the CDC guidance for businesses and workplaces, which I would say is fairly exhaustive, um, probably has more information that you, than you would want to know all the things that you can do to um, have a safe workplace in the era of COVID. Um, and just a brief mention that uh, Department of State Health Services, DSHS, has a uh, five-page minimum recommended health protocols that Teresa is going to go a little bit more into detail here in a second. Um, that also is a great place for exactly what the minimum legal requirements are that you do to make your, um, uh, your place of business uh, a safe place. Um, some of the things that are referenced in these documents are things, you know, like engineering controls, such as plexiglass between two employees who can't social distance. Um, I'll note as well on the CDC website that uh, uh, I think one question has come up, you know, do I need to, any, if I have an employee that's positive for COVID, do I need to hire a special company to come out and, and uh, fog our whole building, um, our whole campus? Um, to kill every last bit of COVID and, and at every nook and cranny. And I think the answer to that is generally no. Uh, but I would look at that CDC website for things that you can do that are very practical and I think get the job done, such as just it's something as simple as using a bleach water mix to, uh, to wipe down high touch surfaces after that employee is no longer at work that has tested positive for COVID. Um, I will say too that uh, uh, just as a general remark that the DSHS uh, does recommend screening and, and temperature checks of your employees before they come into work. I will say that practically speaking, um, and, and actually by the letter of, of uh, what DSH says, that specifically with the temperature checks, it says where feasible. And, and I will say that I, I don't think medically speaking, at least, um, that uh, uh, doing temperature checks specifically on every employee coming through the door is would be at the top of my list for keeping the uh, workplace safe. But um, so, and then finally, you'll, you'll hear a couple different terms, just wanted to find those terms here, uh, isolation and quarantine. I may use them interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, you may hear Teresa using those terms. Generally speaking, the isolation uh, um, applies to a COVID positive case and quarantine applies to a close contact of COVID, of a COVID person. Um, but really we kind of use those interchangeably. The basic idea is that that person is, um, needs to be off of work for a certain period of time, whether they're isolating or quarantining. And I'll turn back to you, Rick. All right, Teresa, what do you have to add uh, okay. on the legal side of that? Thank you. Uh, and 
Ben mentioned, uh, for one thing, uh, temperature readings. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a quick story, give you a quick medical tip before I go into some legal tips. Uh, my brother's a doctor and I um, called him a while back and I asked him, I said, uh, I've been taking my temperature every day and it's, you know, two or three degrees below normal uh, pretty consistently, but today it was 99 degrees. And I said, do I have coronavirus? And, you know, with the bedside manner you might expect from your brother, he said, well, vampira, he said, uh, first of all, 99 isn't high enough for coronavirus. And he said, secondly, if you've been having a temperature that's two or three degrees below normal, that means one thing. He said, that means you have a broken thermometer. And so, you know, that's, that's my medical tip for today. You know, in this type of situation, the thermometer is broken, unless of course there's no pulse. So why don't we go ahead and go on into my legal tips. I'd like to touch briefly on three do's and don'ts relating to preparing the workplace. And I have a number of slides. I'll be moving through them pretty quickly. Uh, these three do's and don'ts are first, do have a health and safety policy. And secondly, do consider DSHS protocols. And third, don't forget about wage and hour laws. All right, the first point, do you have a health and safety policy? As you may know, Mayor Deaver and the Waco City Council recently passed a resolution that extended uh, the emergency declaration in Waco through the end of November. And this is resolution number 2020-746. And I believe it'll be part of your materials. I encourage you to review it. Now, one requirement is that of this resolution is that businesses must develop a written health and safety policy. Uh, the policy must require, for example, that employees and visitors wear masks. Uh, and this, uh, when social distancing isn't feasible. This poster needs to be uh, posted in the workplace, visible to employees and visitors, uh, and fines for violations can be up to $1,000 a day, okay? Now, also on the issue of masks, uh, Texas Governor uh, Abbott, Abbott issued an order requiring masks uh, in the workplace and elsewhere under certain circumstances, again, where social distancing isn't feasible. Uh, this is Executive Order GA-29. Now with this order, following a first time warning, Fines for violations uh, can be up to $250 a day. The final point that I'll make uh, relating to uh, this first uh, issue about health and safety policies, if we can go to the FFCRA slide, is that besides masks, this health and safety policy that businesses in Waco are required to pro post should include a posting about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or the FFCRA. Uh, as you may know, all employers in the U.S. are required to post a notice about the FFCRA. And uh, the notice uh, is available on the U.S. Department of Labor website. Um, now, the second point that I'll, I'll cover is do consider DSHS protocols. And Ben mentioned them earlier. Uh, Governor Abbott issued another order requiring in part that businesses use, and this is important language, good faith and available resources to follow the minimum uh, recommendations uh, pro propagated by the Department of the Texas Department of State Health Services. Now, Governor Abbott's order is GA-32. Um, now, these DSHS protocols are in a checklist for all employers and event organizers. Uh, as Ben mentioned, it's a several page document. It's important for you to review it, okay? But as I mentioned before, um, these aren't all musts. There is some leeway for you as business leaders. 
Governor Abbott ordered us in businesses to use good faith efforts and available resources uh, to follow the protocols. Okay, that's different from just a straight requirement. Also, if you, when you look at those protocols, some of them are worded very straightforwardly, like do this, don't do that. But some have more, are more, um, have more latitude. They might say, uh, consider this, or this is encouraged, or uh, implement it where possible. So the last thing I'll say about these DSHS protocols is that it would be helpful for you as business leaders to make a written record of considering these protocols. If there are certain ones that's just not feasible for you to implement, you know, put a memo to the file. So you have a record that you use good faith efforts and considered available resources in looking at those protocols. The third and final point I'll make on this uh, preparing the workplace is don't forget about wage and hour laws. Now, as you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act has requirements relating to exempt and non-exempt employees. And non-exempt employees are entitled to a federal minimum wage per hour and also to overtime pay for hours worked over 40 in a week. Now, during the pandemic, some of your employees may be working from home. Uh, some employees' works, work schedules may have changed but it's important that we still keep uh, adhering to these hourly requirements and payment uh, regulations for the Fair Labor Standards Act. Another point that I'll make about the Fair Labor Standards Act is that employees own, who are non-exempt only get paid for the hours worked, okay? But they must get paid for every hour work. So if your employees are required to submit to temperature checks or to uh, be tested for COVID, that is time that they are working, that they're, they are uh, doing activity at uh, your business's uh, request. And so they need to be logging that time. Now, and also certainly if employees are working at home, remote, remote work uh, needs to be uh, logged just the same as work in the office. So the final thing I'll mention here is that um, because of the uh, strict regulations about paying non-exempt workers, it continues to be important for you to require employees to write down every minute of time that they work and submit accurate time records. So we've looked at this third point, don't forget about wage and hour laws. Uh, Rick, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, Teresa, so a uh, follow-up there for you that came to mind for me. So if we have an employee who starts exhibiting symptoms during the workday and uh, you send them to be tested or send them home to be tested. I don't know how exactly how you want to phrase that. Are you saying that they, for them to go take that test, at least they are still on the clock for your business? I would, I would go ahead and, and have them write down that time, that hour or, or whatever it is, because uh, they, you haven't yet kind of released them from work. You're sending them to get the test. And I, I would count that as, as a, a paid time. But let's we'll say on the weekend, they're exhibiting symptoms and they go in for their own test. That's not correct company um, related, so to right. speak. Good question. Okay. Great. Um, ben, any follow-up from you after hanging that? Anything else you'd add? Yeah, uh, just before we go on to the next section, I did have one comment. I hope to clarify this temperature checks in light of what uh, Teresa was saying. Um, she talked about with the DSHS minimum uh, standards, health protocol, um, that uh, you have to make a good faith effort. And I think that uh, and, and she said, you know, the language is a little bit uh, more vague in some areas in that document versus others. Uh, the temperature checks, there's, they use the words where feasible. And so I, I don't want to legally try to interpret, you know, exactly what they mean and good faith, where feasible. And this. all I can just tell you is from a medical perspective, I don't think that, I, I think that doing temperature checks, if it's something that is probably a fairly big hassle, um, for a business to do. Um, medically speaking, I'm not sure what it adds to just having um, 
employees report their symptoms when they either daily when they come into work or just reporting to you if they develop symptoms at any given point. I don't know that it adds a whole lot more. And I think the signal noise ratio there is um, fairly low. Uh, I think it may create more problems than, than solutions. Um, and to some degree, that's that's a little bit my personal opinion, but I, I do believe that many um, many businesses, maybe even including um, some healthcare organizations are, are not adhering strictly to that temperature check uh, clause there. Great. Thanks, Ben. I like it. We're getting a little controversial. Kind of exciting. <laughs> um, the next section we will talk about is the sick employee. Certainly at this point, most of us have had uh, an employee uh, be COVID, COVID positive. So um, we want to hear from you guys to see if we handled it wrong or not. So, so uh, Ben, start us off. Yeah. Um, so the, this, the material in here is near and dear to my heart because we deal with this issue, obviously, on the on the healthcare side of things. And I see what I've interpreted to be some confusion, I think many times on the part of businesses as to how to handle this situation. So the first scenario uh, is when an employee um, has symptoms of coronavirus, they're being sent to get a test, or maybe they were sent over the weekend, to have, maybe they got a test over the weekend, but they haven't heard the result yet. And it's now Monday or what have you. So the test has not come back. So what do you do then? Well. Um, it, specifically, specifically with regards to do they need to be off of work while the test is pending? Okay. So the first question is in making this decision, um, it really comes down to actually two questions um, as to whether they need to be off of work while the test is pending. Number one, do they have symptoms of coronavirus? If they have symptoms, yes, they need to be off of work while the test result is pending because they, they got symptoms, they could have coronavirus. There's a, a reasonable suspicion there. The second thing is, are they a close contact to someone with coronavirus? So that's the second question. So even if they don't have symptoms, if they are a close contact to someone with coronavirus, then yes, they also need to be off of work um, while that test is pending as well. We'll talk about um, testing close contacts a little bit more here in a second. But um, the other thing you need to know about uh, uh, the person that's a close contact that does not have any symptoms that they of course need to be off of work after the test comes back, even if it's negative. And I'm gonna really harp on that here in a little bit, but that person needs to be out for a 14 day quarantine if they're a close contact to someone with COVID. So those are the two main questions you need to be asking yourself as far as do they need to be out while the test is pending. So the third bullet point there, you know, basically what about the employee that has neither symptoms nor close contact with someone who's, who has known COVID? Do they need to be out while the test is pending? Actually, the answer is no. They can just go straight back to work in that scenario. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, I'll just add, I'm oh, sorry, you don't have to go back to the previous slide, but there's a deal in there about, um, there's a potential exception for essential and critical workers, uh, it, but in the public sector and healthcare field, um, there are cases where um, a worker may, uh, might is allowed by the FFCRA to uh, work through their 14-day quarantine, even if they're a close contact. So um, in that case, they can um, actually go back to work while the test is pending. But those except those are a little bit more rare exceptions. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a little bit. Um, so here is a big question is, when does the person who has been diagnosed with coronavirus, when can they go back to work? And what is the interface there between the healthcare uh, community and the business community? So that person for all intents and purposes, generally speaking, can go back to work when they are no longer contagious. How do you know when they're contagious or what, whether they are or whether they're not? That is um, what we call the 10 day, one day isolation period. Now you do not need to be a healthcare personnel um, to know what this is, the 10 day, one day and to return your employee back to work once it's up. Uh, this is something that is posted on multiple government websites for employers, for just the layman. Um, again, does not, need to have, does not have to be a healthcare person in order to understand how this 10 day, one day works and when an employee would go back to work. So the three things you need to know underneath there and those, those small bullet points that I have listed, um, the employee can go back to work if they are at least 10 days 
post-symptom onset. So you just simply ask them, when did your symptoms start? If it's October the 27th, then you can go back on November the 6th. That's 10 days later. Assuming bullet points two and three, are they at least 24 hours or one day fever free? And are they also one day or 24 hours um, where their symptoms are improving? At least somewhat. They do not need to have all of their symptoms completely resolved. Most people will still feel tired, maybe have some lingering cough and that sort of thing. But the criteria simply say that they need to uh, be improving at least a little bit. And so those are simple questions, those three bullet points. Um, anybody can ask them. And uh, those are pretty much verbatim what a doctor would ask an employee or a patient uh, in order to know whether they could return to work or not from the standpoint of them being contagious. It's just simply, uh, when did your symptoms start? Are you fever free for 24 hours? Are your other symptoms improving? That's it. Um, now there will be, this is the second major bullet point here. There will be some patients though, by the nature of this virus, that it is a fairly serious deal. They're gonna have prolonged symptoms past this 10 day, one day period. They're not considered to be contagious after the 10 day, one day is up. But what if their symptoms are debilitating enough to where um, they can't go back they just don't feel well enough to go back to work. I just want you to be aware that that situation does come up occasionally. Um, it's the minority of cases, but it does come up medically. And um, in that case, I still don't think that, um, that you need to, you can ask the doctor for another note, particularly if it involves FMLA paperwork, of course. But it, it, in this scenario, though, with prolonged symptoms, the 10 day, one day is up. The only question the doctor is going to be asking them is, do you feel well enough to work? And it's, it's really that simple. Um, yes, you're not contagious. Do you feel well enough, enough to work if you're saying you have prolonged symptoms? And I think that that is something that, um, that the uh, business community is capable of asking as well. Um, let's see, next slide, please. Um, so a big question that comes up, does my employee with coronavirus need a test prior to going back to work just to make sure they're clear, quote unquote? No, they actually do not. Um, the CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, is very clear on this guidance. Um, there is no test needed prior to returning to work. The only test that they need is the one that they initially received to diagnose them with coronavirus. So uh, we have seen in, in some cases, people test positive for months on end. They continue to be testing. Um, their employers want to know, can they go back? And they're waiting for a negative test. And it doesn't happen for months on end sometimes. And I won't get into the logistics of uh, the details of why that happens, um, but you need all you need to know is the person from the, from the standpoint of being contagious, the employee can go back to work after their 10 day one day is over. You do not need to send them for a repeat test and make sure it's negative before they return to work. And then I'll also say um, that with regard to work excuses that I think it makes a lot of sense for us um, as a community um, to get to the point where once you have that initial work excuse um, or somehow proof of diagnosis from the medical community saying that this person have, has coronavirus, uh, that you can sort of armed with, with this information that I've given you here and the CDC and the DSHS, uh, they have information on this as well. Um, that armed with that information about the 10 day one day that you can return your own employee back to work once that time period is up that you don't need a, a follow-up work excuse, just verifying that the exact date that they can come back to work, um, that the Department of State Health Services um, and the CDC be, both make very clear that it's perfectly fine for an employer to decide what day they go back to work um, armed with this 10 day, one day criteria that I just went over. And you see right there, there's a link um, that's also in the resources for the call. That's the DSHS letter for employers. It's in English and Spanish on the DSHS website. And they basically just, uh, reiterate what I'm saying, um, that, it's per that they, they give employers permission to basically give their employees return to work date in this case of COVID. Um, I think that's all for me. Next slide. So yeah, we'll just turn it back to, I guess, Rick now. I'll, I'll uh, cover a few points with respect to uh, sick employees. I'd like to touch on three do's and don'ts from a legal perspective. Uh, first, do grant required leave for sick employees. Second, don't discriminate. And third, 
do grant reasonable accommodations. Now to look at these, uh, I'd like to go through a kind of a simplified hypothetical. When Ben and I were uh, talking about this program ahead of time, it, it, it was helpful for both of us to kind of talk through the different kinds of leave that an employee might be eligible for. So suppose you have an employee, um, let's call her Jane, and she's full-time exempt. There's not hourly uh, pay. She tested positive earlier today for coronavirus and her doctor advised her to isolate. Uh, now, as an employee, she's asked for special treatment in the past. And so you're a little bit concerned that she'll try to take advantage of coronavirus protections available to employees. So you want to learn about the minimum requirements for you as a business leader. Okay, do grant required leave for sick, for sick employees. Now, she tested for uh, positive for coronavirus earlier today. What leave may she be eligible for? Well, first, under the FFCRA, she may be eligible for 80 hours or two weeks of paid sick leave up to a maximum of $5,100 if your company has 500 or fewer employees. Now, uh, if Jane happens, if, if you're a hospital and Jane's a healthcare provider or an emergency responder, uh, your company may be able to opt out of this requirement uh, or out of the F FCRA, but only as to Jane and other employees who are also healthcare workers or healthcare providers or emergency responders. A, a switchboard operator would not uh, be someone that you could opt out. Now, the, there's, so that besides the opt out, then you, you, otherwise you would need to pay 80 hours of paid sick leave. Now, suppose that when these 80 hours are up, Jane takes these two weeks of sick leave she requests more leave because she's still sick. And Ben mentioned, you know, some, um, some patients may, may have uh, debilitating symptoms. Now, under the uh, Family and Medical Leave Act or the FMLA, she may be eligible for as much as 12 weeks of unpaid leave during a 12 month period. And this is if your company has 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. And also uh, if you are not a federal agency, there's a carve out for that. So to apply for FMLA leave, uh, Jane would need to do certain paperwork for you. She'd need to provide a certification from a health provider that she has a quote, serious health condition uh, requiring her to be absent. Uh, and she'd need to uh, satisfy certain other requirements. Then your company would decide uh, if you uh, are obligated under the FMLA to grant a certain amount of leave. The next type of leave that she could be eligible for, uh, so she's taken FFCRA leave, uh, including uh, FMLA leave. She may have accrued paid time off during the year at your company. So say that uh, she has accrued a week of paid time off, she might uh, be out for that as well. However, your company could have a policy that requires any paid time off to run concurrently with family and medical leave because family and medical leave is unpaid. So they could both run at the same time and she could receive paid time off and then she'd be using up that leave. Now, another possibility is your company might have a policy uh, to grant leaves of absence under certain circumstances, you know, within the company leader's discretion. Uh, you know, if, if Jane would request an unpaid leave of absence, it would be important for your business leaders to make a decision about that that's consistent with past decisions about those requests to other employees, okay? So let's go on to the second point. We've covered a lot in that first point. The second point is, of course, don't discriminate. Now, as you may know, an employer may not terminate, 
or discipline or otherwise discriminate or retaliate against any employee for requesting or using FFCRA leave or FMLA leave, okay? And of course, other anti-discrimination laws may apply as well, depending on the number of employees that you have. Okay. Let's go on. Uh, that's a really big topic for another day for part two. Let's go on to number six, do grant reasonable accommodations. Okay, suppose that Jane has come back to work from all her leave. She's, she's able to work, she's able to do her job, but her lungs were damaged by the coronavirus. And so she gets out of breath really easily. Uh, she, your, your office is located on multiple floors in the building. She asks to be moved from the fourth floor to the first floor so that she doesn't have to uh, take the stairs. This calls into play the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. Uh, as you may know, the ADA requires employers to grant reasonable accommodations to employees under certain circumstances so that they can perform their work duties. Now, the ADA is very complex, um, but suffice it to say that uh, your company may be required to engage in an interactive process with Jane to figure out whether her request or some other accommodation is reasonable and would not pose an undue hardship on your company. So we've looked here uh, at three points ending with number six, uh, do grant reasonable accommodations. I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, so um, one question that comes to mind, um, we, we talked about the, the need for the negative test uh, or, or not net medically, that that's not really a requirement. But uh, I think some of us are still running into situations where uh, maybe some companies are still requiring that negative test, uh, or certainly in, in, in my industry in the construction world, sometimes job sites will require a negative test before we're able to put uh, a team back or an individual back on that job site. Can they do that? I guess that's a question for Teresa. Is that is that legally allowed? That's a really good question. And uh, Ben and I were talking about that as well. You can require it. The job site can require it. Employer can require it. Uh, it sounds like it may not. Uh, it, and for example, Ben, I think was, I don't know if he mentioned this today, but we were talking before the doctor's note form that they have Kind of lays this out and and so it, it's clear uh, what their position is so it's it's within a company's discretion but a company definitely can return can require a doctor's note for employees to return to work okay great your next topic is employees who are close contacts you know i'll say as a as a as a business owner it's about as, this one's been very difficult to figure out. To me, it's kind of like uh, pass interference in football. It's, it's, it is a tough call to make. And without, you know, without the um, um, slow motion cameras and everything else trying to figure it out, it, you know, <laughs> these are tough calls. So make it clear. Come on. Come on, Doc. Make it clear. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. No pressure. But um <laughs> I just wanted to uh, say one thing just real quick to uh, tag on to this uh, test before return to work on the previous topic. Um, I think that uh, that the businesses basically are sort of shooting themselves in the foot if they require a test to return to work. Um, as I said, people can have positive tests up to months, even though they're, they're not contagious anymore. And so I would really encourage people to go about the 10 day, one day criteria. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be dealing with return to work and, and leave questions unnecessarily for months on end in some cases. Um, if you go by that criteria of the return to, uh, return to work test. Okay, so close contacts, medical perspective. Um, next slide, please. So there's an excellent website. The CDC return to work guidance for close contacts is in the resources. I encourage you to uh, visit uh, that website. <clears throat> I just want to first make sure that everyone understands what the definition of close contact is. Um, this, like most everything I'm going to mention here, is you don't have to be a doctor to understand this or to be able to define what close contact is by the CDC and DSHS criteria. So <clears throat> there's really two facets of this. 
Number one is the proximity. And the second is the timing. So the proximity, take that first. Any of the following of these bullet points qualify um, that employee for having had close contact with someone with known COVID. Number one, were they within six feet for greater than 15 minutes of that person? If so, that's close contact. And I'll also mention that um, this includes people that had at least 15 minutes of exposure over a 24 hour period. You know, they were with someone for just a few minutes here and there, but it all adds up to more than 15 minutes. They meet that criteria. Um, did they have direct exposure to that person's secretions or droplets, meaning sneezing, coughing, um, um, sharing a fork, that sort of thing. Um, number three, direct physical contact. So that would be hugging or kissing. And number four, um, I see that was number three. Number four is, are they a household member? And um, any of those qualify under the proximity, okay? So now, what if they meet the criteria for proximity though? And let's say that, you know, they were with this person uh, that has COVID, but it was two or three weeks after that person got COVID. Well, they have to meet that proximity criteria while the person with COVID is contagious. So in other words, while they're within that 10 day, one day period, okay? So the first bullet point under timing is what I just said, they have to meet it, uh, they have to be with that person if uh, they're within, if that, that COVID positive person was within the 10 day, one day period. But then the other thing, a little twist on that is the person that is contagious is also contagious up to 48 hours prior to when the 10 day, one day starts. So for most people that will end up effectively being about a 12 day period. Now, if your employee had contact with someone uh, that has COVID, but that person was not within the 10 day one day or with or 48 hours prior during that period, 40 hours prior, then actually that's not close contact. Okay. And so obviously that's, that's super key. Um, you don't want somebody out of work that actually doesn't meet the, the criteria for close contact. Let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, so uh, when does the 14 day quarantine begin? Um, what if they have, what if the person uh, that is having close contact is still in contact with the person that has COVID? Well, the technical definition here is that the 14 day quarantine for a close contact person begins from the last close contact with a COVID positive person as long as the person was contagious at the time. So that's the 10 day, one day period, or uh, also encompasses the 48 hours prior to, to the 10 day, one day period, as I said. Um, so let's go ahead and go. There's uh, that this uh, resource that I referenced there that's, that's at the bottom of the slide. It's also in the resources for the call is the CDC website. Probably the best, very best, I think, CDC website of all the different links that you could have that pertain to COVID because it has awesome color graphics. And so I really encourage people, if I could get you to go to one website for my talk, it would be that website um, pertaining to close contacts because of the color graphics that have, they have calendars of when a person's 14 days start, when it ends, um, how it changes based on when their last close contact was and whether they can avoid cl further close contact or not. Let's go to the next slide. I'll try to try to touch on it just real briefly. So this is the worst case scenario. Um, there are three other scenarios on that website, but here's the worst case. Um, this is a person who basically is a close contact with someone in their household. That, that person, the family member in the household has COVID. Um, they cannot avoid further contact with them. So unfortunately, uh, that person needs to be out of work during their family member's 10 day, one day period. And then after that, their 14 day quarantine starts um, at the, you know, at the end of the 10 day, one day. And so that's an additional four, 14 days. And so effectively it ends up being about 24 days off. And so that's kind of rough, um, but that's what the CDC criteria say. So again, that's, that's worst case scenario. There are other stipulations in there about, you know, what if the two people, um, the close contact and the COVID positive person can isolate from one another within the same household. And it gives a, an allowance for that. So um, that's beyond the scope of the discussion. Um, but please go to that website for further details. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, speaking of what annoying the close uh, viruses that, that uh, nobody wants, everybody m might notice there's a graphic that keeps popping up, the little text box. 
That is not part of his presentation. Uh, we don't know. I've, I've had that happen on some other webinars that I'm doing. So everyone just ignore it. Don't be annoyed. Ben, back to you. Okay, yeah. It, it must be a virus, Rick. But um, anyway, um, so what if the COVID, per, I'm sorry, what if the uh, close contact um, develops symptoms during their 14-day quarantine? What do you do then? Well, use your common sense here. If somebody's got symptoms of coronavirus, whether they're close contact or not, they need to go get a test. So send them for a test. And um, I'll also say that if they test positive, their leave clock starts over. So it cancels out their 14 days then because they actually have coronavirus. And then their 10 day, their personal 10 day, one day period starts, okay? And then what if they go for, um, uh, let's see. Uh, what if they do not develop symptoms of coronavirus during their 14 day quarantine? Um, do they need to go for a test then? Kind of yes, no. The CDC says that they do uh, need to go for maybe at least one test or their 14 day quarantine, even though they don't have symptoms. But I just, I really cannot emphasize enough to the business community that if that employee is a close contact, has no symptoms, they go get tested and they're negative, they still have to do their 14 day quarantine. They're still at risk for coming up with coronavirus. They could get coronavirus anytime during the 14 day quarantine. Um, if they have a negative test during then and they didn't have symptoms, they did not have symptoms, they could still get coronavirus the very next day after they get tested. And so, yes, the CDC criteria say that you need to test people at least once during their 14 day quarantine if they're a close contact. But in practice, I think for many folks, for many folks, it doesn't change employer's management. That employee needs to be out for 14 days regardless. Um, and then I'll, finally, the last bullet point there is um, you do not, just like with um, um, the sick employee who has COVID, you do not need to test them at the end of their time off to verify that they're negative before they go back to work. Okay, I think that's all for what I have in this section. So we can either turn back to Rick or go directly to uh, Teresa for Teresa. the legal perspective. Okay. All right, so close contact. There's one point that I'd like to make. <clears throat> Do grant required leave to close contacts. So let's go back to that hypothetical and assume that Jane, instead of being sick, has been uh, determined to be a close contact. She may be eligible for FFCRA leave. It may provide her with up to 80 hours, two weeks, a paid sick leave up to a maximum of $5,100. Uh, if uh, first she is experiencing coronavirus symptoms and needs to seek a medical diagnosis, or two, her healthcare provider has advised her to self-quarantine due to coronavirus concerns, okay? So she may qualify for two weeks if she has symptoms or has been advised by her health care provider to self-quarantine. But what if Jane is fine? And this is, uh, Ben's been talking about these different scenarios and uh, uh, Rick alluded to it. What if Jane isn't experiencing any coronavirus symptoms and hasn't been advised to self-quarantine by her health care provider? There's not an absolute yes or no. The applicable uh, uh, rules that we should consider is that first, the FFCRA requires paid sick leave if an employee is subject to a governmental quarantine or isolation order, okay? I mentioned before about Governor Abbott's order GA32 stating that businesses must use, quote, good faith efforts and available resources to follow the DSHS protocols. Now the protocols uh, state and include a, a rule or a recommendation that a close contact should self quarantine for 14 days, okay? But so the company leaders need to consider this in good faith and taking into account available resources. And again, whatever the decision, I recommend that company leaders write a memo to the file, document their consideration of this, if, uh, deciding whether Jane should uh, be out or as a close contact or stay in. 
So we've looked briefly at this point, number seven, do grant required leave to close contacts. Turn it back over to you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Great. Well, let's uh, let's let's keep things moving. We got uh, a little bit of time left. Um, let's let's talk about caregivers real quick, Ben. Yes. Um, actually, before we specifically mention caregivers, um, same slide, but I just wanted to back up a little bit, a little broader perspective. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What about this scenario that comes up frequently at work, where you have an employee? Let's call them person A has exposure to person B who is a close contact of a COVID positive person who is person C. So does person A need to be off of work in that scenario? So effectively person A has had no exposure whatsoever to anyone with coronavirus that we are aware of. The answer is no, they do not need to be off of work. <clears throat> now, the reason we put this under the caregiver section is because um, if person B that they are being exposed to, if they're the caregiver, if A is a caregiver person B, person B has to be out of school or daycare or work, what have you, uh, because they're a close contact. So of course, in that case, person A would need to be out of work um, to take care of person B. But I, I want you to understand that, that in the normal scenario where person A is not a caregiver of person B, that they do not need to be off of work if they have exposure to someone who is just a close contact but does not have COVID, okay? Um, then there are FFCRA uh, stipulations, which I believe Teresa may touch on here in a second as to um, what kind of leave uh, if you're caring uh, for someone who is say a, a, a dependent who's out of school or daycare uh, due to being, a, um, uh, due to a closing. But let me go to the next slide. Uh, actually, that's all I had on that. Okay, I have kind of a, um, a substantive kind of detailed point on this one. And then for the last sub, uh, issue that we'll address about intra-organizational contact tracing, my point, my remarks will be very brief. On this one uh, for caregivers, uh, my point is do grant required leave to caregivers. So let's consider Jane. Um, suppose that she isn't sick, she isn't a close contact, but she's requested leave because she needs to care for a young child um, and the child care facility is closed due to the coronavirus. The FFCRA may provide her with up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at two thirds of her regular pay, up to a maximum of $2,000. Now, under the FFCRA, she may uh, be provided with an additional type of leave in addition to that 80 hours. She may be eligible for 10 days of unpaid leave and then additional days of paid leave at two thirds of her regular pay up to a maximum of $10,000, quite a, a large amount. But for this second kind of grouping, the first 10 days of this unpaid leave, she may be able to substitute uh, 10 days of paid leave that's provided elsewhere through the FFCRA, making uh, all of her leave uh, paid. So uh, again, she'd need to provide proof to the company that she's eligible, that the child care facility is closed, that she needs to be home to care for the child and satisfy other requirements. So that's uh, the kind of the point I wanted to touch on for do grant required leave to caregivers. All right. Um, Intra-organizational contact tracing. And um, I, I just want to tell our, our viewers, uh, we, we are prepared to go a little bit past the hour. So uh, we, if you can hang on and get some of that bonus content, feel free to do that. Uh, otherwise, we're going to keep pushing on. Ben. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, I did verify before this talk. Um, I want to make sure I give you all the correct information that uh, the McLennan County Health Department is perfectly fine with businesses doing contact tracing within their own organization. So what that means is that you have um, John Doe, who's your employee. They test positive for COVID. 
Well, you got to find out if anybody else at work is is a close contact of theirs, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the state helps with that to some extent, either DSHS or I think in some cases the health department, they sort of divvy it up, uh, those responsibilities of contact tracing. But every organization can do this uh, within your own organization. And many of you may already be doing it. Um, I think it's a good thing. Um, the McLennan County Health Department agrees uh, from the emails I've shared with them about this. Um, now, you, you say, well, how do I do that? <laughs> uh, well, number one, um, there's a, uh, as with everything, there's a link in the resources that is, gives exhaustive information about how you can do contact tracing within your organization. Now, as far as the, the brief, though, just the, the logistics and mechanics of that, um, <clears throat> Effectively, what you do is you just decide, you know, you kind of go around in that person's immediate area or people that may have been in the break room with them. You sort of just ask employees. You're not supposed to use the person's name because of uh, privacy concerns and, and protected health information. So don't use the COVID positive person's uh, name or information. Um, but just say, you know, an employee was diagnosed with COVID. Uh, we have, you know, reasonable suspicion to think that you might have been a close contact, but um, do you remember uh, being with this person? I'm trying to think of a way that you would say that without giving their exact name. Um, but I think that uh, you do the best you can. You do the best you can knowing that um, it is okay to do organizational, uh, inter-organizational contact tracing um, while uh, doing your best to respect privacy concerns. Um, so what are the criteria for whether someone's a close contact? So that's just what I've already covered about, you know, the 14 day quarantine, the section on close contact, the proximity and the timing. You just decide, did they have the timing? Did they have the proximity? If they did, they're, they're a close contact. And that person needs to be off for 14 days from the time that they were last exposed uh, or had close contact to the COVID positive person. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, as I say, there's a lot more complicated, I mean, you can get a lot more details if you look for them in the CDC website, uh, but that's how you do it from a medical perspective. Now, from the logistics of how you report it to the health department, you simply just call this number 750-5411, and the health department has said that you just call them, and basically they will send you an Excel file that you put the, the information of either the COVID positive person or their uh, close contacts or both, you put that information in the Excel file, and then you email it back to them via secure email. It's got protected health information, so obviously it's got to be um, sent securely. Uh, but that's how you would do that. And again, you use the same criteria for close contact that I just shared under the, the section for close contacts. Uh, over to you, Tra uh, Teresa. Okay, uh, so when uh, Ben mentioned uh, uh, confidentiality of data, this is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, that requires us to uh, not say that Mary Jones has tested positive for coronavirus, but that uh, someone on the floor or someone in the department has tested positive for coronavirus. It may be easy for employees to guess who, but I would we shouldn't confirm it or deny it. Just kind of not disclose the identity. The other point I wanted to mention about this is we start at the beginning, I think, talking about temperatures. Taking employees' temperatures are medical tests. So even uh, my temperature reading on a certain day is confidential. To, is confidential. So uh, there shouldn't be like a log sitting out in the break room for everybody to write down their temperature. Instead, for example, a dedicated uh, HR staff member should be logging uh, the temperatures. Uh, that log needs to be kept absolutely confidential. And it even needs to be stored separately from other personnel files. There's an extra layer of uh, confidentiality and security for medical, uh, medical information. So those are the points that I wanted to make on this uh, intra-organizational contact tracing. Great, it sounds like a fun game of Pictionary trying to do contact tracing inside your business. I'm sure all the HR people are really excited about that. That's right. Um, okay, so so we do have a few uh, Q&A questions that uh, that hit the Q&A during the talk. Um, uh, let me kind of go through a few of them with you guys as time allows. But uh, 
uh, Jim Holmes asks, has there been any case law of uh, em employer liability uh, as it relates to COVID? There have been uh, complaints uh, about discrimination, uh, like, um, uh, you know, I was denied this paid leave under the FSCRA and, uh, and, and so that was against the law, things like that. Uh, and I think there are going to be, there will be more and more cases filed. And so hopefully some of the information we're providing today will uh, keep, keep your company's names out of the caption. And, and I think to your point earlier, uh, the more you document, uh, the better chance you have of defending yourself, right? That's right. Um, Ken, another question had to do with uh, work policies. Can businesses have uh, uh, policies that are stricter than what the CDC is, is recommending? Is that allowed? That they can, that's right. Because um, businesses, you know, feel, they want to keep the doors open. They want to keep employees safe. Uh, they don't want everyone to get sick. So they may, uh, we talked about before, require a, a doctor's note before a person returns to work. You can't have stricter policies. Um, so Ben, in wearing the wearing of masks, uh, there's a question here about uh, how that affects the close contact call on the field, so to speak, if they're wearing a mask. Right. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, impact it. I wish it did, but um, there's still, you, you notice I was silent on that issue. I probably should have specifically said it does not affect it. And so you got person A and person B wearing masks, but they otherwise meet criteria for close contact. They're still close contact. Well, aren't you just a ray of sunshine? Okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. Learn about all these uh, ins and outs. All right. Um, Okay, another question has to do with the, the scenario of a, a new employee that has not accrued PTO or vacation time or sick leave. Um, you know, what, uh, what ways did the company have getting them paid? And I, I think you mentioned the federal uh, paid time off that that's allowed. Um, you know, what, what else is there besides that? And, and, and I'll tell you even from, from my uh, viewpoint as we get towards the end of the year and we've had more and more team members that have used up their federal PTO, um, you know, it kind of gets a little more critical as we're getting closer to, to January. That's right. And um, if you have an employee handbook, that, for example, that says that the company in its discretion may grant um, uh, leave under certain circumstances, you know, that might be something here where the company would decide that they uh, well, here they're talking about getting the person paid. This might be something where the company might decide to, to pay the person. But uh, there should be, if the company has 500 or fewer employees, there should be payment available under the FFCRA and uh, possibly even the FMLA. And the company can set the requirement to return uh, based on the information that, that Ben uh, gave uh, and, uh, and or requiring a doctor's note. So uh, hopefully that, that, that gives some starting points to this uh, person who asked the question. Um, all right, let me, let me do one more. Uh, in the, I think the question, I think it has to do with policies. If, if employees are giving permission to uh, their employer to, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's around the information, their health information and what even, so as a, as a business, even if the employee gives you permission to use their information beyond themselves, is that, what, what's the law on that, Teresa? That's a good point and uh, that's a good question. If I, if, if an employee gives permission, the information can be disclosed. Uh, so if, if uh, I test positive for coronavirus and then I'm out and my company's going to have to be going around the office, figuring out who had close contact, I may say, listen, why don't, it's okay if you let everybody know, just send out an email to everybody and, and let them know that's completely allowed. 
Okay, hey, Ben and, and Teresa, are there any other questions in the Q&A or the chat that you guys want to touch on real quick before we bring it to a close? Um, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, I don't know that I, uh, let's see, there was one that did not uh, get answered, I don't believe, about um, uh, is it necessary to file COVID cases as workers' compensation as well, especially if they are first responders? Um, my first thought is it'd be difficult to prove that that person got COVID um, from their work environment versus a community exposure. But uh, Teresa, do you have any further comment on that? I, do, I saw that, I guess that was in the chat. Yes, right. I think it would come down. I don't have a specific answer. I think it would come down to whether the person was ex definitively exposed through work as a starting point. Right. And then I, I have one more comment, Rick. I just want to make sure everyone is aware. And there's actually a question pertaining to this in the chat that um, <clears throat> there's a neat little uh, colorful graphic that the chamber um, helped us come up with uh, that pertains to what to do uh, for leave time um, when the test is pending and then after the test comes back. And so that's in the resources for the call. And so I encourage everyone to, to look at that. It's a um, pretty cool resource. Great. Well, hey, with that being said, Teresa, Ben, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to I mean, for what you guys charge an hour. I mean, this this uh, webinar, I mean, it, this is uh, pure gold. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for what you guys do in the community and, and how you're, you're serving in this way. Um, and thank you to, to those of you who joined in. We're glad you could make it. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, um, We'll see how this goes. If, uh, if there's a need to put more of these on and, and share more information, we'll look for opportunities to do that. Otherwise, thanks. Have a great day and stay warm. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.